Here. Me too. Here we are. The last section in chapter three. Measures of center. Remember that was mean, medium, mode, that sort of stuff. Uh, measures of variation, uh, standard deviation, range, uh, those sort of things. Uh, three, four is going to be measures of relative standing and box plots. Uh, but um, relative standing is is really important, and box plots are uh, are uh, easy, so it won't be a big deal. Okay. So in this section, we're going to introduce uh, relative standing measurements uh, that that make it easier to compare different samples. Okay. Remember when we, we did that correlation uh, variation? You know that that or variation coefficient. You know in the last section, the the re, the relative standing measurement that we're going to use called a z score makes it a little better to compare samples with and, and compare uh, various data points in those samples and, and are they uh, work there. Talk about percentiles, quartiles, that sort of thing. That's where the box plots come in uh, and uh, and work your way through that. It's really a pretty easy. Mathematically, it's a really easy section. It's not, not really heavy lifting at all yet out of that. But we're going to learn about a z-score. That's our big thing today. Okay. Z scores, percentiles, quartiles, box plots. That's our things. All right. A Z score, standardized value. Okay. It's the number of standard deviations that a value X is above or below the mean. Okay. So we're looking at a particular value. How far is that above or below the mean? That's what a Z score tells us. Okay. How far something is above or below the mean? A particular value or score, if we're talking about test scores, you know, class average was a 85 and I made a 92. How far above, you know, and I need to know something about standard deviation also um, get there, but I'll be able to look at my score and see how far away from the mean I was, it was plus or minus to the mean. Okay, that's what a Z score is. Here are your formulas for Z scores. You do need to know these. Okay. You are going to need to know these. So, uh, for a sample, we're taking the the data point we're checking minus the sample mean divided by the sample standard deviation. For a population, the data point we're checking. Minus mu, that's the mean from the population, divided by the standard deviation of that population. Those formulas, very quick and easy to just crank out for us. We're going to find that z-score based on those formulas. They're going to give us that information. They're going to give us a, uh, a value to check, give us the mean, the standard deviation, and we're just going to do the work there and, and learn some things based on that. We'll get further with what else can you do with the Z score later on in the book. All right. Here's a rounding rule for Z scores two decimal places. Two decimal places. Different rounding rule than anything else. Okay. Rounding two decimal places on Z scores. Always. All right. When you're interpreting a Z score, this is kind of how it works. What we're doing is taking whatever data values we've got and reducing it down to a nice small number line. So it's easy comparisons. Zero, that's that a Z score of zero means you're exact you're equal to the mean. You're at you're at the average, right? Uh, ordinary values are within two standard deviations either way of the mean. Remember we talked about that, about what's a usual value, maximum usual, usual value, and low, uh, minimum usual values. Uh, well, if we convert those to z-scores, a ordinary value, something that's typical of the data that we've got in the sample or the population, are going to lie between negative 2 and positive 2 as a z-score. 
Anything bigger than positive 2 is a z-score is an unusual value. Anything less than negative 2 is an unusual value. Okay, so z-scores, uh, just like usual values in data, uh, except for we're looking at it, uh, you know, in terms of relative to the mean and the standard deviation for the data set that we've got in the sample of the population. Okay, so within two, remember a z-score is how many standard deviations you are away from the mean. That's what a z-score is. So the closer you are to zero, the closer you are to the mean. Okay. Further you get away from that, the more unusual you will be. All right, here's just an example of that. So uh, pulse rate, 48 beats per minute is what we measured. Just resting pulse rate. Uh, is that pulse rate unusual if the mean adult male pulse rate is 67.3 beats per minute with a standard deviation of 10.3? So they're saying, okay, what's plain X in this problem? 48. It's the measurement we're checking. X bar, 67.3. That's the that's the mean for a sample that we we've used. And then the standard deviation uh, obviously is 10.3 because it says standard deviation, right? So plug that into the z-score formula. Work that out. Get a negative 1.87. Where's that at in, re in reference to the mean? Above it or below it? Obviously below, 48 is less than 67, right? So we know that's going to be below, but how far below? It's almost two standard deviations below, but not quite. So is that an unusual value? No. It's almost unusual, but not. You know, negative one point, eight seven. That gets fairly close to negative two, but it's not past it. So it is a usual, you know, normal value out of that. Could we work backwards and find uh, what is that mark? Where is two standard deviations below? Okay. So if we're going to do that, just think about that. If I want to know where is an, you know, where do the unusual values on the low end start? And I don't. I don't have a data value. I'm looking for X. But I have everything else. Yes. Where do the unusual values start with Z scores? At Z being negative two. So we could set up this equation where we know 67.3. And then 10.3. We could set up that equation algebra style and find that point at which the unusual values start. We could also go the other direction out of that. So, so don't be surprised if that isn't what you've got to do. I mean, that's just regular some algebra stuff. You'd multiply by 10.3, negative 20.6, and add 67.3. Somebody help me out with the math there. Is it 47.3? All the whispering and not a 46. 46.7. 46. 46.7. So anything, a pulse rate below 46 or at 46 or below is going to get us an unusual low value. We could do the same thing, just change that to a positive two to get what's an unusual high resting pulse rate out of that. So we could, we could use this information we're given out of that. Uh, so. Nice ideas there, things, things that could come up. All right, percentiles. So we talk about z-scores. Z-scores is in reference to the mean. Percentiles are um, locations uh, where you're at in reference to the whole group. Okay, um, they're denoted. The notation for that is p sub one is the first percentile. P sub two is the second. 
P sub 50, or the subscript of a 50 is the 50th percentile, and then P sub 99 is the 99th percentile, kind of that stuff. Uh, we're just dividing the data set into 100 groups, about 100, 100 or one percent of the values in each group. That's what we're trying to do there. Uh, but what a percentile means, if you're the 50th percentile, that means your your value is, you know, for whatever data point we're looking at, if we're looking at heart rate, if you're at the 50th percentile, that means your heart rate is greater than 50% of the people. If you're at the 67th percentile, your heart rate is greater than 67% of the, the rest of the group. Kind of That's what that means. Um, I see this a lot with my kids. We go to a checkup every October. That's when their birthday's on. So we go to a checkup and they measure them and, you know, with the tape around their head and all this stuff. And my kids have got big heads. Their doctor said it's because they got a lot of brains. And I'm not sure about that. Uh, but but anyway, the oldest one, he's the percentile in every category. Like his head size, height, weight. I mean, he's just a big kid. Uh, the youngest is the he is like right on the 50th percentile every time so he's average as, as far as size goes um, definitely probably won't be an average person uh, when it's all said so, uh, that's the idea all right so let's look at percentiles here's how you find a percentile a mathematical method for that the number of values less than x divided by the total number of values okay and then you multiply that times 100 Change it into a percent. Can you have some scissors, please? Wow. They can have the string on the shirt. It's bothering you? Yeah, because it keeps unraveling. Cross curricular stuff here with the. Don't cut her hair. That's in the video. I'm not going to cut her hair. I'm going to keep trying to. Okay. All right, so we got the formula for percentile. Number of values less than the X that we're looking for. The total number of values that we have times 100. Okay. Here is an example of some stuff with Chips Ahoy cookies. And I'm more kind of, I know it's hard to see, and I wouldn't expect you to copy this down or anything. Uh, we want to find the percentile for a cookie with 23 chips. Okay, so we count all those up. We see there are 10 cookies that have fewer than 23 chips chips if we counted this chart here okay and then so that's 10 how many cookies were there total there were 40 because they told us that 10 over 40 times 100 that's the 25th percentile 23 chips is at the 25th percentile of chocolate chip cookies pretty good okay 23 chocolate chips and i don't never stop to count them all right, converting uh, from a percentile to a corresponding data value, so going backwards. If you're given a percentile, going backwards to get that data point out of that, okay? I got this ugly looking formula here. You just got to know what it all means. Uh, K is the percentile you're using. So if it's the 50th percentile, K is 50. Uh, if it's the 25th percentile, it's 25. Uh, and then N is the number of values in your set. How many how many chocolate chip cookies did you count? You know, for our example, it was 40. And then L is the locator. That's going to tell you what position that's in, where that's at. Not what the number is, but where it's at. Okay. L is a locator. So this is going to tell you in order what what spot you're going to. Okay. Here's a little flow chart. <laughs> that uh gets you all that same information all right so if is here's what happens this is what i'm what this is saying i'm just going to simplify it if if your locator is a whole number then then the percentile that <coughs> number that the percentile is is midway between the whatever that number is if number is eight the the actual Percentile is halfway between the eighth and the ninth piece. Okay, if it's not, you're going to round up. Okay, always going to round up. If it's a decimal, if the L is a decimal, you're going to round up. 
If it's not, if it's a whole number, I'm going to take that one and the next one and average them. Let's look at here. A quartile is just a special percentile. All of the work's the same, but a quartile is a quarter of the way. So you got the first quartiles at 25. Second quartile would be at 50. Third quartile would be at 75. So all of those, those are the same things uh, out of that. So quartiles are just special percentiles. They're just at the 25, 50, and 75 marks uh, for that. That's, that's what quartiles are. Which takes the data set and breaks it into orders. Second quartile, third quartile, all that, the same thing we just said. Very simple concept. Quartiles are 25s on when you think about percentiles. Really, really easy. All right. Here's a little way they show that when you divide up your quartiles, you got a minimum value, maximum value. Your median, a lot of times, is right here in the Q2 area. Should be right there. I mean, if it's not. A median that had to be averaged that's where that q2 that 50th percentile is you know if you you had to take the two values in the middle and average them to get your median that's where you know that locator uh b there is got to you know you got to think about that all right so quartiles just split it up into fourths here's some other things inner quartile range iqr i think is an abbreviation you'll see uh, quite a bit inner quartile range is q3 minus q1 this is seventh grade stuff. They, they do this in the seventh grade and they talk about box and whisker plots. Uh, interquartile range is one of those things they talk about. So Q3 minus Q1 is interquartile range, IQR. Semi interquartile range is just taking half of that. Q3 minus Q1, dividing it by two. You remember we had that, that value we called the mid-range back in uh, a couple of sections ago? And the mid-range, you always added them together and added the minimum and the maximum divided by two. The mid-quartile is the same idea. You take Q3 plus Q1 and then divide by two. A mid-quartile. Not exactly sure how helpful that is, but it's nice to be able to say, hey, I'm mid-quartile. And then this is kind of a special one, is the 1090 percentile range. Um, and you're just taking the 90th percentile minus the 10th percentile. And they call it the 1090 percentile range. Interquartile range, semi interquartile range, mid quartile, and percentile range. 1090 percentile range. 90 minus 18. Simple, simple math stuff here. All right, five number summary. These are the if I ask you for the five number summary, this is what I want. And these are the things that I'm asking for. And I I won't list them out. I'll just say give me the five number summary for this data set. Those five things are the minimum value, the first quartile, the second quartile, same as the median, the third quartile, and the maximum value. When we did one variable statistics with our calculator, it gave us all of those. And it gives you the five number summary. Um, my stats teacher in college, uh, he, he, he called it a six number because he wanted the mean in there too. But if I ask you for the five number summary, this is what I'm asking for. Minimum, first quartile, second quartile, third quartile, and maximum. That's the five number summary for a data set know that and again do one variable statistics with the graphic calculator it, it gives you all of those you don't have to do it by hand or anything it'll give you all of those what does two variable statistics do it's if you got two different set data sets and it'll put it'll give you both of them at the same time like you had um Class A's test scores and class, you know, my first period and my fourth period class test scores all on the same thing. It would calculate all those together, and that way you could compare them on the same screen. It's really all together. And then it also helps kind of look at if there's a correlation between. Them. 
it does a few different things, but all of the same things plus a couple others. All right. Box plot, box and whisker plot, what, what we usually call them in a math class. Uh, it's a graph of the data sets, that, a line extending from the minimum value, that's the first whisker, and then to the maximum value. So it's like a number line, but the box is Q1 and Q3. All right, you remember doing these? You may, may or may not remember doing them in uh, seventh grade or eighth grade, maybe freshman algebra. I don't know. We do them a little bit. I usually just kind of brush over them right before we take the end of course test because I don't really use them a whole lot. But that's what a box and whisker plot looks like. You got Q1 here, and Q3 here. This is your minimum. There's your maximum, the median, then here inside the box, should be somewhere right there, median, Q2. All five of those values are part of what? Five number summary. The box and whisker plot is the five number summary on a number line. That's, that's what it is. Okay. So, so it all kind of relates together there. It makes, makes sense that you're getting many of those things out of it. Box and whisper plot. And your graphing calculator will do a box and whisper plot uh, just like it does a scatter plot, except you just select box and whisper plot instead of scatter plot. And it'll make one for you. It's not that you have to. I mean, you, you can. Like I said, one variable stats, and you're getting all five of those of the five number summary. It'd be tough not to get that on the number line correctly, I would hope. All right. Five number summary, construct a scale with the values that include the minimum and maximum value. So when you're setting that up, you've got a number line, set your scale up where you're not having to, you know, if your smallest numbers are two and your biggest numbers are 365. Probably don't want to go by ones, right? But you want to set up a scale that will get you to 365 from two. Uh, and then in a box, you know, go on that number line. Where's Q1? Where's Q3? Why, where's Q2? Put that box in there. Draw your lines extending to the minimum and the maximum values. It's an easy thing to draw and do. Get the five number summary is the first step. And then if you don't have a five number summary, you can't do a box of whisker. So make sure here's an example of that minimum value, maximum value. They used a line instead of a dot. But I'm not that good. I don't know. But that's, that's what it's going to look like. On a normal distribution, um, notice how that box is right, you know, looks like it's right there in the middle. You know, real nice and neat. The median is right there in the middle of the box. And it looks about the same distance from here to here as it is. It's not exactly perfect, but it's close. So a normal distribution. Remember, normal distribution fits that bell curve uh, where you know, everything is right there. You know, 68% of your data is in the middle within one standard deviation, 95% within two standard deviations, 99.7% uh, within, within three standard deviations. Here's a skewed distribution. I like that. That's a nice one. It looks good. Yeah. yeah. You gotta be talented. Strong. No. There we go. There's our skewed one. Obviously, this one is skewed uh, right. As all the data is falling down here on the lower end, close to the minimum. Outliers and modified box plots. Just the last little bit here. We're almost done. Um, outlier, we know what that is, right? 
I know it, you know, it's very different from all the other data values uh, out there. Okay. Outlier can have a, a big effect on your mean and your standard deviation. We already know that. If you make a zero on a quiz, it pulls your average way down. As opposed to if you make something close to what you're already averaging, it doesn't change it very much out of that. Okay? So we, we know how an outlier works. Um, it can have a big effect on the scale of our histogram because we got you know that really low number that's fallen into a class there. That's, it, it, you know, it can can throw off things and how we think the data is is falling in there. Is it is it normal or not? Uh, so outliers are not always you know not really good things, but. Oops. All right, constructing a modified box plot. We can uh, consider outliers to be data values that meeting a specific criteria, okay? So here's our criteria, okay? Above Q3, if it, it's an outlier if it's 1.5 times the interquartile range, okay? So it's a data value is an outlier if you can multiply the interquartile range by 1.5 and that number is that far above it, okay? If it's also an outlier on the other end if it's 1.5 times the, the interquartile range below Q1. So if Q1 is like, if Q1 is 20 and your interquartile range is 10, okay, so Q1 is 20, so let's do that. You have 20, Q3 is 30. So IQR here is what? It's 10, right? Mm -hmm. So an outlier on the lower end would be 15 below that, right? So five or less is an outlier on the lower end. On the upper end, an outlier would be 45 or higher. Those are outliers. That's how we can justify you know, calling something an outlier. Um, very, in statistics, you can't disregard data values without a very valid reason. And, you know, it's got to be a strong argument as to why I need to throw that one out. Uh, which is, uh, you think about in the course scores and those tests that, that don't take. That counted for you guys in three years, but they count for me every single year. But you can't just throw out y'all's scores, even if you know I was I marked answers and slept through the rest of it. You know that's what you did, but I can't. That's not a good enough reason for me to not count your score, according to the state of Tennessee. So, uh, but you know because maybe maybe Trevor could work it in fifteen minutes and take a nap the rest of the time. Or somebody else, you know, they took 15 minutes just to click through it, and then they got an eye on it, that sort of thing. So you got two different situations, but the same amount of time spent on the test, so it makes it hard to, to throw anybody's test score out. So throwing data out is tough. Calling it an outlier, though, we can get some, some definition to that as to what makes something an outlier. And this is how you're going to do that. Okay. All right. Well, it's changing on my screen, but not on yours. Here we go. All right. Box lots uh, that we talked about, or at least could be called skeletal box plots. So if you see that word, regular uh, box plots. Uh,
it says some statistical packages. That would be some sort of uh, program. There's there's a, a program I had to use when I took stats in college. It was called Mini Tab, and it had all these little special features that you could do out that. I think uh, Google Sheets and uh, Excel does some neat things. Mini Tab was specifically for statistics. It was what it was designed for. It works a lot like a spreadsheet, but it's a little bit different uh, in the buttons that you have and the options you have out of that. But regular box plots, um, skeletal box plots are the same thing. Modified box plot, uh, we could have a special symbol, asterisk or, you know, smiley face or frowny face for an outlier. Something different to identify your outliers out of that. So you might have might have something out here that's an outlier. You know, we're calling that an outlier. So that line extends to the max, but if it's an outlier, we don't extend the line to it. That's the difference in a modified box plot and in a skeleton box plot. Okay. Minimum, minimum, same way. That special character out there. Don't extend your line all the way through if you're drawing a modified. Here's an example of a modified box plot. Your graphic calculator will do a modified box plot. Uh, when you pull up the, the stat plots, the first option for that looks like a box plot is a normal one, skeletal one. The second one is a modified one that will do your outliers and things. Uh, here we go. I'm trying to sum things up here. Uh, Basic tools used in statistics. This kind of sums up a lot of the things we're doing here. Uh, context of the data, what, what kind of data is it, source of it, the sampling method that we use. This is all like chapter one stuff. Uh, chap and then chapter two uh, and three, or chapter two was the sampling method stuff. Chapter three, we've been on the measures of center variation, the distribution, uh, normal distribution skewed. That sort of thing. Outliers, we just talked about uh, changing patterns over time, uh, and then con uh, conclusions and practical implications. That's where we're going to head after this. Um, that's the things we've done thus far. All of it kind of relates back together, though. Uh, we're we're at this place right here, and kind of going to try to build into these things. Okay. And there's a lot of stuff involved with those things, but it's all built up a little cut so far. Okay. So for section four, what I want you to work on uh, is uh, page 123, I think is the page number uh, for the practice. Yeah. And uh, one through 36, I believe. Yeah, one through 36. So page 123. One through thirty-six. That's your your practice for this particular section.